professor of English at a college. She has a blog, you can find it. And then uh, I think her best qualification for today's presentation is she's the mother of five kids. And she helped navigate the school system for those five kids. So I'll return over there, sure thoughts. Good evening. Um, as Bill said, I am a mother of five kids and I do come here tonight to speak to you as a mom. Um, what's going on in our country today is very concerning. And a few months ago, I was speaking to another mom who was also concerned about critical race theory. And um, as we were talking, the conversation you know, sort of drifted towards critical race theory, and she kind of launched into this tirade about critical race theory and why it is good and why we need it in our schools. And we had to have it. And then she said, you know, most people don't want it in the schools because they just don't understand it. And I said, you know what, you're right. Most people don't understand it. And so I started to tell her what critical race theory is. So I started out by telling her what critical race theory is not. I said, this is not a new civil rights movement. It's not about um, dignity and humanity and respect, so don't be fooled into thinking that it is. This uses shame and degradation to bully people to make them change. It's not ripping off the Band-Aid and accurately teaching American history. History should be taught in its full context, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we, when we push back against this, it's not that we want a sugar-coated version of history. We do teach Jim Crow. We do teach about slavery. We do teach about colored and white drinking fountains and colored and white bathrooms and sanctioned segregation and when our country had systemically racist institutions, separate but equal. But we also should teach about progress. And we don't do a very good job of that. This is not about equality, I told her. This is not about liberty and justice for all. This is rooted in an equity agenda. And equity and equality sound a lot alike, but they are not the same thing. Equity seeks guaranteed equal outcomes. And the only way you get equal outcomes is when you corrupt a system to favor one group of people over another. And in my book, I call that discrimination. This is not just a benign academic concept that's only discussed in law schools and universities. See, that's their argument. And I don't even really know if they're still using that because it is so apparent that that is a big fat lie. We know that it is in government, we know it's in our schools, in our corporations, and yes, it is in our K through 12. You just have to know what you're looking for, and I'll talk about that later. And they teach that kids, they should view everything and everyone through a lens of whiteness and oppression. And that racism happens all the time, every day, in every single interaction that you have. And that racism is the cause of all economic disparities in our country. They teach that there are no individuals. Every person is a part of a group, a member of a group. And all members of this group are exactly the same. And that's how they justify false assumptions about people based on race. If you're white, you're a racist. If you're black, you're a victim. So if that's what they're teaching, what does this look like in the classroom? Well, in the classroom, we go from education, which is the free exchange of ideas, to indoctrination. And that is not the function of our schools. The primary function of our schools is to help our kids become responsible, civic-minded, productive members of society. Americans don't like it, and Minnesotans don't like it. Only one in five Minnesotans think that critical race theory should be taught in our schools. So what is critical race theory? That's our slide, <laughs> one in five. <laughs> what is critical race theory? Critical race theory is an offshoot of critical theory. Critical theory is a Marxist ideology that dates back to Germany in the 1930s. And it divides society into two groups, the oppressed and oppressors. And everyone belongs to one of these groups. And this comes straight from the Communist Manifesto. Well, communism, Marxism, is a really hard sell in our country, so critical theorists had to find a way to package this Marxist ideology so that it is not only acceptable, but it is necessary. This is something that we have to have in our society. And the sad part is they're deliberately deceiving Americans because they know, if you know what this really is, that you will never agree to it. So they took this little emotionally charged word race and critical theory morphed in its entirety into critical race theory. It's been around for a long time, but it became an academic discipline in 1989. So pretty new package, same only product.
So who better to use to advance this agenda cloaked in racism than a demographic with a history of racial oppression? So you convince the oppressed that the black and brown kids, that the system is rigged against you and you're never gonna get ahead because of white privilege. And then you convince the oppressors, the exploiters, or the little white kids, you have white privilege. You are guilty of things that you didn't even do and you need to be embarrassed about stuff that you can't change. And then the most important thing is, and this last element, it doesn't work, nothing else works without this, you have to seize control of the language because he who controls the language will control the culture because you control what people think and they're masters at manipulating language. They just change definitions. I was talking about this with someone earlier. They just change the definition of words. So we're talking about one thing, thinking they mean one thing and they're talking about something entirely different and you will never hear them call it critical race theory. They use a series of euphemisms when they're talking about this because they're constantly rebranding it. So when you say, are you teaching critical race theory? They say, no, because they're always calling it something else. When someone starts talking about equity audits or social emotional learning, white privilege, white supremacy, culturally responsive teaching, the 1619 Project, social justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion, anti-racism, ethnic studies, this is all critical race theory. So why is this concerning? Well, it's concerning because these nice, harmless little words don't capture the radical political intent behind critical race theory. They use words that kind of trick your brain because a word like equity or anti-racism or inclusion, who's gonna oppose a word like that? Those are things that everybody is for. We're all supposed to be that. But these words mean exactly the opposite of what you think they mean. The language is deceptive and it absolutely works. I was talking with a friend, a white friend, a few months ago, and she challenged me on this concept. She said, I've learned my whole life that diversity and inclusion are good things. Why are you now saying that they're not good things? And I said, you know what? We are not speaking the same language. We're not talking about the same thing. They're slick, they manipulate the words so that when they say, so when you say anti-racism is not good or social justice is just wrong, you look like the bad guy. Who opposes anti-racism? So you convince the black they're wrong, you convince the whites they are wrong, and then you re-educate this public school population using this new language and you have a perfect storm. Except they ran into one little problem all of you. They were not anticipating that you were gonna be informed about this. They certainly didn't think COVID was gonna have our kids home for nine months with parents looking over their shoulders, and they didn't think you were gonna push back. They absolutely did not think you were gonna oppose this. And they certainly didn't feel like you were gonna see the holes in their faulty logic. So if the premise is all white people are bad, the founders of our country are white, so you kind of see where this is going. White people are bad, founders are white, Therefore, the United States of America is fundamentally bad. And that leads to the delegitimization of our values, our justice system, our free market economy, our constitution, and ultimately, our country. So critical race theory isn't just about race. It is way bigger than race. It's more than just some academic debate. It is a bulletless revolution to change society culturally and socially as we know it today and they are weaponizing our children to do it. And that's why kids learn that George Washington is the bad guy. Was George Washington a middle-aged white guy? Yes. Was George Washington a slave owner? Yes. But we all know that that does not define George Washington. For these people, it's not about examining, this is what they tell us, examining the effects of racism on society. This is a world view is becoming a new orthodoxy. The definition, this is their definition, it's kind of truncated. Critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order. The very foundations of the liberal order. That is our rules. They're questioning the foundation of our society. And the definition continues, unlike some academic disciplines, critical race theory contains an activist dimension. It not only tries to understand our social situation, but to change it. That's their definition. They don't wanna just understand it, they wanna change it. 
which is why they come up with all these little words and these rules to change things. So who decided that skin color takes precedence over your character? Who decided that we should be separated into these affinity groups based on race? Well, we didn't decide that. Most Americans today do live by the principles that Martin Luther King taught. Taught people to look at uh, dignity and humanity and encouraged us to look beyond race. So critical race theory is not replicating Dr. King's philosophy. It's actually replacing it. And it's these principles of critical race theory are taking us right back to where we started before the civil rights movement. So it's not only going backwards, it's trivializing the experiences of those who lived through true sanctioned segregation and true racism in our country. And just because you push back doesn't mean you're a bunch of racists who want to preserve some system for your kids. It means you're Americans and you recognize that teaching children to disregard character and to judge people based on the color of their skin is wrong and it does not create a healthy environment for any child, black or white. The Reverend Wyatt T. Walker, who was an advisor to Dr. King, when he was pointing out the harmful effects of critical race theory, he said, today, too many remedies, such as critical race theory, are taking us in the wrong direction, separating even elementary school children into explicit racial groups and emphasizing differences instead of similarities. The answer, he said, is to go deeper than wealth, deeper than ethnic identity, deeper than gender, to teach ourselves to comprehend each person not as a symbol of a group, but as a unique and special individual within a common context of shared humanity. Critical race theory is not new. It's not new. It, it seems like, though, it came out of nowhere because now all of a sudden, everybody's talking about it. And we're talking about it because we're seeing it in real world application. They're transforming our schools into something they were never intended to be. So where are we gonna end up? We're gonna end up with a bunch of social justice warriors who can't read, who can't write, who can't think, and who will be easily controlled. And we actually have the test scores to prove it. Test scores in core areas have been stagnant or in decline for years. So while we're fighting about melanin and diversity and inclusion, we're not producing engineers, doctors, and electricians, and nurses and teachers. We're not producing the things that we need that, makes our, that make our society run. So what does this look like in practice? I have a few examples up here. Wyzetta Public Schools. The summer reading list contained a book called Not My Idea, a book about whiteness, in which the author says, racism is a white person problem. Burnsville. Fourth graders read a book that warns that police are mean to black people, but nice to white people, and they don't like black men. In Hopkins, school officials vow to restructure student learning around 13 characteristics of white supremacy, which include requiring black students to turn in assignments on time, and abolishing traditional letter grades because we all know that traditional letter grades are linked to dominant white culture. Minneapolis public schools, you cannot make this stuff up even if you tried. They hold segregated staff meetings. One for black and brown staff members, another one for white, yeah, I see, yeah, they, they absolutely do. White Bear Lake Middle School, they had a middle school activity called Privilege and Oppression, which sounds like the name of a book, but they divided children into groups of privileged and then targeted groups based on race, sex, gender, color, obviously. And then the students were asked to share how they felt about being oppressed or how they felt about being an oppressor. St. Louis Park, they are opening up their gifted and talented program to everyone with a focus on anti-racist talent development and I don't know what that means. <laughs> Brooklyn Center, staff members attend anti-racism trainings based on the writings of Ibram X. Kendi, who says that the only remedy for past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy for present discrimination is obviously future discrimination. And this goes way, way beyond our classrooms. This year, the Minnesota uh, social studies standards are being revised and it happens every 10 years. 
And this is what every high school student needs to know before graduating from high school. Well, the first draft came out and it replaced academic knowledge and skills with lessons in politically correct attitudes. They inserted politically co political correctness at the expense of key events that shaped our nation's history. Little things like uh, the American Revolution, the Civil War, uh, World War I, World War II. There's no mention of the Holocaust or 911 or 9-11. Um, and Minnesotans saw this and thousands of them said, no way, uh-uh, you are not gonna do this. And so they kind of walked back the first draft. They released a second one in July, which still lacks important historical content and still includes themes focused on systemic racism and power struggles among the races, but there's no mention of CRT because they're constantly rebranding it. They even put out uh, uh, a statement that said, we are not teaching CRT, we are teaching ethnic studies, which is exactly the same thing only it has a new name. We're waiting for the third draft. So if you want updates on how this is going or you want to submit feedback, you can go to American Experiments Raise Our Standards website, www.raiseourstandardsmn.com, and you can um, uh, stay, stay um, informed there. The National Education Association said they decide what your kids learn in school, not you, and they have elevated themselves to this godlike status. They take your tax dollars, preach this new orthodoxy, turn your kids against you, and teach them to hate America. There is a difference in teaching and confronting ugly truths of our history and fundamentally rewriting the story. No one is saying students should learn history. That's not what we're saying. Was there racism in the United States? In the United States history, absolutely. My father grew up in the Jim Crow South. He was born there. So he grew up drinking out of the colored water fountains, using the colored restrooms, riding in the back of the bus. He joined the segregated army. Now that was no way to live. It was awful. But there's nothing that we can do to change it. And I'm not telling you this story to tell you how bad white people are or to tell you how evil our country is. I'm telling you this story to demonstrate how far we have come. He was born in the Jim Crow South. 40 years later, he got full rights guaranteed under the US Constitution. He saw a black man elected president, and he saw his children, me, and my seven brothers and sisters take advantage of opportunities that he never, ever had. That is progress. And that's what we do not talk enough about. When our country's history is told well, we don't omit America's faults but we don't use them as a blanket explanation for all the disparities. Do we have racist people in this country? Absolutely. But are we a racist country? Absolutely not. Our education system is not aligned with our values. So the question we get from parents most, that might be why you guys are here, is what can I do? Well, one of the things that you can do is you can download the parent app called Illuminated and it connects like-minded Minnesotans, provides resources to fight for our children and their education, and it also has a parent connecting tool that will help you organize either locally or with other parents across the state. You can visit www.illuminate.com for more information. You can understand critical race theory and how the woke culture is manifesting itself in our classroom. It is anti-capitalism, anti-American, and anti-Christian. Talk to your children. Find out what they're reading in school, what they're talking about, and what's being read to them. Start working your way up the chain of command. You don't like what your kids say? Call for school. When you call the school, don't call the school and say, are you teaching critical race theory? Because they're gonna say no. And not only that, that kind of gives away your your stance where you are. Instead, call and say, um, yes, can you tell me about your initiatives around diversity, equity, and inclusion? And then just listen. Listen to what they say. Do you hear the buzzwords? Do you hear talk about equity? Also, check out supplemental resources, because a lot of times, this is where they sneak stuff in. Brain pop, full of critical race theory. Band together. Find like-minded people. You're in a room full of them here. 
we outnumber them. We far, far outnumber them, but they're louder. So a lot of times we think numbers equals volume, but it doesn't. And I cannot see any parent agreeing with this. And if they do, you better believe they probably don't understand what it is. When you go to your school board, take one or 200 of your closest friends. <laughs> run for school board, fire them. If you can't run, get behind somebody who can. Efforts have succeeded across this country on this one issue alone. And remember to vote. This is an off year election. Um, school board elections are this year. They're hoping that we're not paying attention. Vote and get all of your friends to vote as well. Review textbooks. Um, American Experiment works with Truth in Textbooks to train parents to review textbooks for factual inaccuracies and biases. If you want to be, um, get in more information about this, email Katrin Wigfall at katrin.wigfall at americanexperiment.org. Request public data. Um, ask to see training materials. What's going on? What are they teaching our teachers? What are they doing that might be promoting CRT? And then talk about it. Get people talking about it. What are the consequences of this on our society? You know, what are possible questions you can ask? They're always asking us for evidence. Show me the evidence. Well, you know, I say, don't ask me for evidence. You show me your evidence. This is a theory. You're the one who follows the science. You show me where this works, where has this been effective, and what is this gonna look like when this is all over with? Stop letting them control the language. Don't be bullied into thinking you're a racist when you know you're not. They think they're the language police, but they're not. And they know if they call you a racist, which really, honestly, has no meaning today. If they call you a racist, but they know that you're gonna be frightened into silence. But don't be silent, because silence equals compliance in this case. So don't back down if someone calls you a racist. You're not a racist just because somebody else says you are. And chances are, you're being called a racist by a white person who is endorsing segregation. It makes no sense. <laughs> also, consider a different school choice. I'm not gonna go through all of these. They're up on the screen behind me. But don't be afraid to pull your kids out of public school. Do not be afraid to do it. You can find alternative ways to educate them. But remember, regardless of where your kids go to school, you cannot escape this. So don't pull your kids out, bury your head in the sand, because this is all over. Public school kids will touch every single segment of our society. They're gonna be our CEOs, our government officials, employers, employees, even people your kids marry. Now I know this seems like I am painting CRT as some kind of big bad boogeyman, and it's because I am. We should absolutely be alarmed about this. If I thought this would benefit my kids in any way, I would be all for it. Today, a woman in Monticello said to me, well, you know, there's racism in our society and we just don't always see it. If I was walking down the alley and three big black guys came walking towards me, she was a white woman, if three big black guys came walking towards me and I crossed the street, that's racist. I said, well, okay, so what if the same thing happened to me and I crossed the street? They would call me smart. Don't you see there is no way that you can win this. You cannot win. So that mom that I was talking to, um, she sent me an email that afternoon, and she told me that she's married to a black man, and he grew up in inner city Chicago, and he is 100% against CRT. He saw and felt the impact of that victim hit message on him and his childhood, and he does not want his children growing up hearing the same thing, and she thanked me. The end game here is to tear down America, and that is why we cannot accept it. Because the America that we know and love and critical race theory cannot coexist. One will win out. So my question tonight is, are we going to give up? Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's a question you're really supposed to answer. Are we going to give up? Or are we going to stand up? We're going to stand up because Minnesotans deserve better and our kids can do better. Now I know I've talked a lot about pushing back and fighting back and you know, but I'm not encouraging anybody to go out and like get really confrontational because this is Minnesota and we're Minnesota nice, right? right? We're Minnesota nice. Well, I'm saying be Minnesota nice, but just add a little bit of spice. Thanks. <laughs>
this point, I normally tell a joke about how Sheila and I met. We met, actually we met in high school. But we don't have time because he's got to go somewhere and I'm going to hold him up. But, um, you know, we did meet in high school. Sheila and I, we've been married for 35 years. She tells me, well, like, stop telling people how long we've been married. They can do the math and they'll figure it out. I just said, look, we got married in Oklahoma so at, you know, at 11. It was legal. <laughs> but, um, listen, you know what? We, we're here. We're here to inform Americans of what's going on in our society with the most transparency and truth that we can, that can get to you and, and the urgency we can get to you. Now, cr critical race theory, not just in schools, it's being pushed in, in, in corporate, it's being pushed even in the military. It is not a new civil rights movement. There's no Martin Luther King in front of this thing. Al Sharpton is not even in the front of this thing. Okay, this is a po political left agenda using the racial disparity numbers to justify their agenda. And I'm gonna go through to you sh and show you um, exactly what those numbers are and what you're gonna find and what I'm gonna share with you is that they're not racial disparity numbers. They're two parent family disparity numbers and I'll get to that in just a minute. So as I get started here, what I wanna do is go a little bit further on this whole narrative you always, have to, you always have to question, be concerned about organizations or people that tell you that they're not doing something, but they change the name of it and they don't want you to really know what's going on. That's a surefire concern of what's the agenda all about. So just this past summer, the National Education Association, the teachers union, the largest teachers union out there, they meet annually. And at their annual meeting this summer in June, that new business item number 39, and I, I didn't get, to, I didn't pull out the full thing. This is just an, uh, an excerpt from it, items A, B, and C. I want to pull out and share with you one of the things that they, they put, they're going to double down, double down on. And one of those is that they're going to fight back against this anti-CRT rhetoric. They're going to form committees and go around the country and fight back against people like us, they being anti -gay. Now for me, I want to, what I want to understand is, why are you going to form a committee to fight back against something that you're not doing? <laughs> right? We're not doing critical race theory. Why, why would you even form a committee around that? So this is, this is their definition, not mine. Right? Second point is that in this item B, they have capitalism. That they're going to fight back around this and the, on, on all of these bad things, racism, uh, white supremacy, anti-blackness. And they put capitalism in there. Here's, here's something that... Like, Maybe we need to educate them on this, that capitalism has actually lifted billions of people out of poverty. In the history of the world today, this is the least number of people that we've had in poverty and starving in the history of this planet because of capitalism. And if, but they may not know it, that, that the vast majority of, this, of the parents, the students, they earn their living through capitalism and they want, and they want to, to fight against it, and, and, or, or speak against it. I have big concerns about that, because if you, if you're, if you want to denounce this, what are you promoting, right? Here's the other part of this. This is item, item C. They're going to partner with Black Lives Matter and other uh, organizations, um, and 1619 is one of them, and they're going to promote and rally for George Floyd's birthday on October 14th, as a national day of action and all these different things. Well, they lost me right there. If they're going to partner with Black Lives Matter on anything, they're not in line with me and they're not in line with this country. Black Lives Matter is anti-family, anti-American, anti-white, anti-Christian. Their, their, their whole philosophy has nothing to do with this country. The, the, you know, and it's, it's ironic that the, the rights that we give people and organizations because of our, our freedoms and our laws that we have you get, you get to have the uh, uh, organization that hate the country and promote in the country while you're living in the country. That's what Black Lives Matter is. If you don't believe that, you can look on it, we get on our website and download their own beliefs and views, it's on there. They, they're number one, and one of the things they want to do is disrupt the nuclear family. Um, you, you can't get more um, radical than that, and they want to partner with them. So I want to share this with you guys so you have to see what, what, what's going on behind the scenes that you typically don't see from proponents of critical race theory and what they'll never share with you. And you're going to get more of this in this presentation. 
So this is what our organization is about. And just from a time perspective, I won't go through a lot of it, but we have five pillars. The first one is America works. The promise of America works for anyone, regardless of race, regardless of social standing. Number two, the fastest way from poverty to prosperity is the private sector. In order to play in the private sector, the third column, you need a solid education. Sheila and I both are products of the public school system. We don't want to tear it down, we're an advocate for it. For the public school system as we know it, not the one they try to transform. The fourth pillar is rebuilding the two-parent black family. I'm going to speak to this. This is, this is a, 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 literally a bird under my crawl here. Um, on the day that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, the black American family was nearly 80% two-parent families. I was five years old. In my lifetime, we went from 80% two-parent families to 80% fatherless homes without one initiative to reverse it. I'm going to say, if we were a beetle or a spotted owl, we'd be on the endangered species list, and there'd be all kinds of programs of saving the black family, bumper stickers, you know, radio shows, you fundraisers, everything. But we've been used for 50 years at the political pond, and it stops right now. <laughs> the fifth, the fifth uh, column there is the first priority of public officials is, is the public safety of their, of, their, um, of their citizens. Now, these five pillars, if you were to tell your, your parents or your grandparents, what, what does Kendall do with his take charge? If you would explain this, they would, they would ask you, why would he need to do that? It tells you how far we have gone and that we need a recalibration quickly in our country. All right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right here for a second, just give you a little recap. So one of the reasons I'm a big, big proponent of, of this effort, I've, she and I, we've been, we've been all around the state. We put on nearly 10,000 miles in, in four months. For me, I guess this is the 20 something talk, talk for, for Center for American Experiment, but I've been doing this as, as Stanley Law's take charge by request from all over the state and four other states on this issue. I'm, I'm a big um, advocate on making sure people hear real news because here's the, here's the irony that we, we have that you'll never hear, but it, it is truly ironic. This is the least racist period of our country's history in one of the least racist countries in the world. And you know what? You would never know it by the, by the loud drum beats from the, the academic, I call it the academic industrial complex, okay? And our media. It's true. So let me just tell you quickly. Um, so my, when my parents divorced, I was five years old, five, six years old. We lived in um, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. My father had just come back from the Vietnam War and my parents divorced. And we moved from there to Harlem, New York, where my grandparents lived. My mom took us five, five kids. I was one of the younger ones down at the bottom. And to Harlem to live with her, her mother, my, our grandparents. We, we take the Greyhound bus, Grand Central Station, take the city bus to Harlem, 125th Street and 8th Avenue. We walked three blocks to 128th Street. But by the time we got to the second block, we got held up in broad daylight. I can tell you what it's like living in a city that's un where the police are unfunded. The mob rules the streets. Half of these reports that we get, what's going on, uh, the police reports, is, those are underreported. Most of these people don't report it because they don't want the retribution from the thugs in the neighborhood. Literally, that's what happens. Back then, they, there was no direct deposit. So a lot of these, these elderly people got social security checks, checks in the mail, and they got other checks, the, the welfare checks in the mail, when they had to go to the place to give them cash, they knew every month they were going to get held up. So they always hid the money. They never took their purses because the purse was always snatched. I was a little kid. I'd see it all the time. But I used to prep before they leave, leave the apartment. So I, I, um, I went to elementary school there. I fought probably two days a week. That was okay. I could defend myself fine. It was going home to the public housing project that was always going to be unpredictable. Never knew about the shootings or the fights if I was going to get pulled out and just, just harassed. And that was just the normal, normal day in, in that environment. The biggest issue was when the elevator didn't work, I didn't, never knew what was going to happen walking up, walking up the stairs. The elevator didn't work 50% of the time. Walk up the stairwell, 10, 10 flights up to our apartment, but the stairwell was always pitch black because the drug addicts would knock out the light bulbs, light, and they were shooting up heroin in the stairwell. 
So I'm in second grade, navigating through these guys. Finally, knock, knock on the door to apartment 10A, and it seemed like forever because my mom, we had seven locks on the door. <laughs> and um, my mom would open open the door, and it was like a beam of sunshine that just overcomes you, like in a dark cave. Because my mom would pull me in, give me a big hug, and I get a whiff of pine saw. Because, <laughs> because my mother was a woman from the south, she believed that she believed that cleanliness was close to godliness. Everything, you know, it's so ironic. I mean, there's really it's just the city. The city was really dirty and filthy. It was just a mess. But you go in this little apartment. And everything was clean, spotless clean. It was incredible. You know, we had a little card table, dining room, dining room, dinette table for, for meals. It was covered with one of those plastic checkered picnic things. Everything was clean. My, my mom had high standards for us. She told us, you know what, Kimbo, just because you live in a place like this doesn't mean you have to live like you're from a place like this. And um, she wanted us to do well. She wanted us to have a life. She, classic mom of her era. She never had a driver's license. I saw her apron over like half the time, but I could, the weight of the world was coming down on her. My, my older brothers and sisters were getting absorbed into the street culture of Harlem. She would put us to bed and I could see just the worry on, and anxiety on her face. A few years later, my father came and picked me up and my brother, my younger brother, uh, at this point I was in fifth grade, and he took us back to live with him in Oklahoma. He was a drill sergeant, he was still in the army, he was paying alimony and child support, and all he could afford was a small trailer and a trailer park. And that was my childhood. That's how I got my start in life. And I tell people, look, what I've learned over the course of my life, the thing about this country is where you start in life is not where you have to stay in life. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I didn't know anyone that had um, the life outside of my sphere, but I knew it started with an education. You know, the neat thing about education, it's a great equalizer. And uh, so I paid my way through college. I worked full time. Paid my way through college, was in the Army Reserves. I was also in ROTC as well. And because I was in both ROTC and the Army Reserves, I got commissioned as a second lieutenant, an officer, when I was 19 years old. I was still a junior in college. Now, if you ever read the book um, uh, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, he talks about a concept of high level of advancement and achievement reaching 10,000 hours of high level of performance. And in the book, he, he references Michael Jordan in basketball and the Beatles and music and Bill Gates and computers getting early, early starts. And uh, for me, I was getting early start in leadership, development, and training from an organization that's been doing it for over 200 years, the United States Army. I had men reporting in to me when I was 19 that were my father's age. I was making all the goofy, dumb mistakes that the junior guys make when they're young, you know, when they're new in the role. I did, you know, got through that at an early age while I was still in college. And by the time I graduated four years later, or two years later at that time, um, I went on active duty. I was on the, I was the field artillery, the big guns, and um, there's the foreign edge of the sword. And so, you know, it was always funny when we used to go back on Thanksgiving and visit you know, Sheila's folks and our parents, and, and they would hear the rounds going off, make loud the, the, the practice, and my kid would jump in my lap. Dad, Dad, is that, is that thunder? Is that thunder? I said, no, son, that's the sound of freedom. And, um, and the, because artillery was the big guns. After a few years uh, serving here in the United States, I went uh, overseas, I volunteered, I served in Korea. One of the neat things about this, is, this is one of the reasons I got involved in, in the public arena. I mean, we don't hear enough about the good things our country does. We get slammed all the time. But you have the, the Korean people, one ethnic group, divided by a line of freedom. Now, when I was there, I called it Korea 1.0. They had just started exporting their stuff. Um, Hyundai and Kia, they weren't that great then. They, they had to have a 10-year, there was a reason they had to have a 10-year warranty. But they're best, much better now than Korea 2.0. But here's the thing. Same ethnic group, the North Koreans today versus the South Korean cousins, the South Koreans have a 12-year higher life expectancy than the same ethnic groups in the North. They, uh, they're eight, eight pounds on average uh, heavier because of the malnutrition of the North. And second, they're actually two inches taller. Just over like four or five generations of malnutrition. The North Koreans, they basically, they, they harass their neighbors with, you know, with rockets and nuclear weapons and stuff. The, the South, Korean, South Koreans chose free market capitalism, not socialism. 
We don't get money from them. They're not a vassal. They're not a colony of the United States. They're living their life. They chose a direction, and they have one of the top 15 economies in the country, I and mean, in the world, actually. That's what I learned when I was there. I was also, you know, I had the responsibility for, um, as a fire support officer for a tank battalion right on the DMZ. It was my job, outside of that newly deployed M1 tanks, it was my job to bring hell on earth to that battalion to eliminate our enemies, either through close air support, jet, fighter planes, helicopters, naval gunfire, artillery, and anything else that we can get, slingshots or anything else. It was all came through my shop. And uh, I understood what we had to do, and, I, and that responsibility at that point, I was 24, 25 years old. I decided I didn't want a career in the military like my father. I didn't want to move all, all around the country. So I got out, got out of, uh, I got an honorable discharge, started with Johnson Johnson, started my corporate career, we moved nine times in 27 years. <laughs> um, but here's the thing, uh, I joined Johnson Johnson in sales, sales management, went back and got my MBA uh, from the U of M. By the way, that's the other U of M in Ann Arbor. Uh, I know, it's a bad one, bad one. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, so the leadership is kicking in, the strategy piece is kicking in. I got promoted to the home office and marketing, marketing strategy, not promotional, but marketing strategy, product manager, then product director, two years later. Four years later, on this one brand, I've been on four years now, we, we launched the brand from zero to a billion dollars. I'm a group director. I have 10 people work, uh, working directly for my team including PhDs and everything else. Um, 3,000 people executing our strategy, sales, sales commercial team, $95 million budget, I'm 36 years old. 30 years previously, I'm less than an hour away when I was held up with my mother in New York City. A story like that only happens in America. I share this story with you, not to boast about my career, I share this story with you. It was another reason I got involved in the public arena. When I started hearing that the three, well, about four or five years ago, the country's systemically racist. There's white supremacists. We need to go to socialism, maybe capitalism's not the way to go. I'm like, wait a minute. I've never heard. This, this, is, this is untrue. Just because someone that looks like me says it doesn't make it true. So I started, I, I came out and I got involved in the public arena. And one of the reasons I did is because in my life, in my lifetime, people helped me along the way, in my personal life, in my professional life. They didn't have to. I had nothing to give them. Literally, I had nothing to give them. But they did it out of the goodness of their hearts. And they guess what? They look like you. They look like me. Americans, regardless of their backgrounds, help other Americans when they see them trying to better their lot in life. Those people were white, they were black, they were male, they were female, they were rich and poor, everything in between. So it's not just my life that I saw that. This has happened millions of lives that I've seen it. I've lived in nine different countries. I've been, been all over the country. In every major, every major city in this country, there are organizations helping those kids born into circumstances not of their own making. And a lot of those people that help them look like the kids they're helping. And this narrative that they have is not just wrong, it's evil. It is deceitful that it undermines the very character of who we are as a country. And I'm not gonna let it happen, okay? I just, I, look, and you, know, you know what? I, um, I have issues, I just have issues. Look, I was 19 years old when I gave, gave oath to defend and protect the Constitution against enemies foreign and domestic. And let me tell you, that oath has no expiration date. And so I, obviously I didn't win my, my election. And I, I, I was joking earlier, I said, boy, by the end of the year, my opponents, they're gonna say, man, this Kendall, he's more dangerous on the wild. We need to get him in office. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is what happens when you get the guy private sector out here who's, who's had a taste of poverty and, and, and knows the, the travel. So here's, here, now, now, with, now with that context, I'm gonna go fast, I'm gonna share this data with you and understand why, why I, the story was important for me to understand, for you to understand the context. Now I want to tell you about this issue of the black community. You know, this is who we were before we had help from the government in the 60s. We were a culture that was nearly 80% two-parent families, and we were, our character was focused in three areas, faith, family, and education. We were the most vocal demographic about faith, even through the worst areas of our history, the, the economic depression of the 20s and 30s, Jim Crow South, 
40s, 50s, nearly 80% of two parent families. The next question people ask me, well, what happened? Well, I can tell you what happened. You know, first of all, I just want to say, intentionally maybe good intentions initially, but used late after that. There was a program uh, in the 60s that was launched called Aid the Family with Dependent Children. We call it Well Clearing. And um, it was marketed in the black communities in the 60s. And you can see the, uh, there's, uh, in the, on this slide, a case, the caseload between 1960 and 1970 jumped up nearly 200%. And basically what it did, it provided financial incentives to young women as long as they remain unmarried. Now when you say that out loud, it sounds amoral, because it is. And um, he, what, did the, what did it cause? Again, I, I, I give, you know, initially I said, look, maybe good intentions, but after the second, third, and fourth decade, they're like, wait a minute, we need to do something here. Not just for the, for the, for the we see the collateral damage with the kids. And let's go through that. So here's what happened. So right here, 1965, Daniel Patrick Moynihan wrote a, a huge report. That, um, it was called The Crisis of the Black Family. Actually, it's called Crisis of the Negro Family, because that's what they called us back then. And he, is, he was a US senator from New York. Before he was a US senator, he served in the LBJ administration. He has a PhD in social work, and he was helping on uh, reducing poverty. He recognized that there was a problem in the black community. 24% of the births were to unwed moms, okay? No fathers in the home. This is not divorce, no fathers in the home. He said, if these kids, if this continues, these kids will struggle academically. They won't, they won't be able to fulfill their lives and, and, and experience the, the, uh, the freedoms and, and, and all the things that we know as American and American dream. He was told to sit down, shut up. He didn't know what he was talking about. He was racist. Everything that report has come to fruition. Everything. And sadly, what we are seeing is that was a catalyst for change. Now, it wasn't totally because of that program. Social morals changed. All that changed. So it was a component. But I'm going to tell you, in the private sector, you show me the financial incentives, and I'll show you the behaviors. Any company, including this kind of program, all right? So that was the beginning of disparity. So what does that look like? So when you go back to 1960, the marriage rates of women, all demographics, were roughly about the same area there, okay? Ages 25 to 34. You see a statistically significant drop after that program brought, to, brought down. It was, it was sad today, I'm going to tell you the black community, what we're, we're helping to turn around, is these young ladies, a, a wedding is a rare sight. And what these young ladies are not you know, dealing with is like, they don't want to be alone. Our culture is not producing an environment for marriage and family. It, it, we got a total re, you know, restoration to do. This is a tragedy. This is, this is, uh, in 2010, this number is declined about 25% today. And so what's the impact? What's been the impact for 50 years for these children? And I mean, you, uh, we know this intuitively, you know, but there's plenty of studies. This is just one of them. I mean, four times greater risk of poverty, two times greater risk of infant mortality, more likely to go to prison, more likely to commit crime, more likely to, it, I'm gonna tell you, it, it, these guys are talking about, well, the reason why this has happened because there's this pipeline from school, no, that's, that's a bunch of crap. Okay, the data tells what happened. In fact, you look at 1970, this never existed before. We had, after 20 years, look about the mid 90s, what happened here with the unwed births? What happened in, 19, in the mid 1990s that we never did before as a country? Bill Clinton was president. We had to, we had to actually fund a national police effort 100,000 cops, if you're old enough to remember that, and it, that the, we're gonna put 100,000 cops, because we, start, we started seeing things in, in the papers that we never saw before. Was it because of crack cocaine? No, it was because after 20 years, we had, we had a, a huge number of young boys that wasn't raised by, with their fathers. Of course they're gonna get into trouble. It, it, it's, it's an asinine. So anyway, here, this is what happens to these kids. What's not up here is, higher percentage of sexual abuse by these young kids as well. When they're unprotected, you see a higher percentage of sexual abuse and, 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 uh, and physical abuse of the young boys and the young girls. 
Here's, I show this slide. I show this slide. This is slide, fathers, no fathers. This slide, 1960, late 1960s. Okay? 80% fathers home. 80% fathers in the home. The reason why there was disparity in the 60s is because our country did not give black Americans full rights to the Constitution. I mean, this, is, this is why we had a civil rights era. These kids, to, these kids on your left are more apt to be successful in today's arena than the kids on the right fought the 80% fatherless homes. They never got the socialization at home, the social instruction. They, they, today, 50% of kids in Minneapolis, Tennessee, Minneapolis public schools are graduating 50%. 50%. It's been that way for the last six to seven years, and the legislature won't give those mothers school choice. It's tragic. My friends, we didn't used to live like this. If this slide should, should say fathers, no fathers. I'm going to tell you, my father's a drill sergeant. When your father's a drill sergeant, you get to make one mistake. <laughs> okay? That second mistake, it's all you. It's all you. you your, your picture, and that, that, and back then, you guys remember, they, they used to have little pictures on the milk box. Missing child, have you seen this child? That would have been me. Especially if I was dressed like this, heading toward the front door. <laughs> this is the difference. And, and what this has created, literally, this is cultural genocide. This is the culture that came out with Jackie Robinson, Willie Mays, and actually Condoleezza Rice. It, it came out with, with also with Michelle Obama. This is the culture. This is who we were. This is not our culture. This has been corrupted. And, it, and, there's, and, and, and there was never an initiative to turn it around. We're starting it with Take Charge in Minneapolis. This is not who we are. And, we're going to, and we know better, we're going to fix it. And guess what? The moms that live in this community, that live like this, they don't want to stay like this. And they don't want their children to stay like that. And you, this is the biggest elephant in, in the room from critical race theory they never want to talk about. And all of their programs that they have, critical race theory I'm talking about, all of their programs, None of them addresses the two-parent family. It's not on the last page, last bullet item. It's not there at all because they don't want to address this. And I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. So what's, the, what's, what's so critical around this, the same kids from these neighborhoods, same streets, if they are fortunate enough and blessed enough to get a scholarship to go to any one of these schools, they graduate in 95% range. Their test scores, their standardized test scores are at the top in the country. It's not that they don't have the capability. It's just set high expectations. And kids rise to some level of that expectation. Even if they don't hit the bar, they're going to rise to a higher level of expectation. Um, so how do you know for, for, tell you, when you're, when you're from the private sector, especially if you're a military army guy, you just don't talk about problems unless you've got some solutions. And so that's what we're doing. That's what Take Charge is all about. And uh, so one of the things we're talking about in go out, so I'm going into the black community. I'm going on offense. I want to take away this excuse that the critical race theory the left have been doing in the black community for 50 years is, is address these address these, uh, these disparities. But we've got to start from the bottom up. And so I'm starting. I recruited some of the most lethal weapons known to mankind to help moms <laughs> <laughs> and grandmoms. <laughs> we have one of them here, a mom. She's our grandma. And um, they, they, they do terrific work. And the catalyst, they're the boots on the ground. So I'm going to use my military analogy. They're the boots on the ground. We got a few good men. Okay? <laughs> Today, um, we got some strategic partners that we're, and this is growing every week. Partners we're working with to get in front of young kids to talk about, you know, there's like 200 nonprofits in, the, in, in, in downtown that are helping to service the poor. Not one of them talks about marriage. Marriage. We're reconstituting the idea of marriage in these young people. And we're getting young black families with little kids in front of them so they can see that, wow, if they can do that, I can internalize that for themselves in their own future. Those are the things we're doing. My goal is to get 50 to 75 by the end of the year. Today we have about 30 volunteers. We're almost there. And they're going to be the boots on the ground in, in, in the Twin Cities, um, returning the culture back to faith, family, and education. Right now, I am so busy. I, I have 21 other cities that want to start Take Charge chapters all over the country. Mm -hmm. Wait, give, give me another, give me, I just need 12 months to, 
finish year, we started at the beginning of the year, we're only eight months old. And we're trying to get done through the end of the year, then we'll start going out um, at next year, in first quarter, going to Minnesota where people go. All right? Um, so, and we, so we have air support. So the boots on the ground, are the, well, we have air support, and the air support I use is the media. So if you've ever gone to PragerU and, and been to their libraries of, 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 um, of, of videos, we've developed one of the largest, it's, it's happening organically, I didn't know this was gonna happen. We have 10 videos now more, they're growing all the time, people from the community talking about the love of country, how bad critical race theory is. So it's not just me up here, you just, well he's just a politician. We, everybody up there, we have a guy that started, started uh, Black Lives Matter in St. Paul, founder and president. After a year and a half, he was like, yeah, but these guys, this is, they don't care about black lives, they don't care about black families, and they don't care about school choice. They have better education. He got out and we got a video that went viral. He got uh, interviewed on national news all over, as well as um, coffee as well. Your, yours is doing quite, quite well, and yours is not up here, because this thing is increasing almost every two weeks or so. And we didn't talk about the benefits of marriage, so I'm gonna get to some statistics I'm running on time here. This is, this is uh, again, one of the critical race theory. Here's the disparity gap that we don't talk about. So the, look at the racial disparity gap. Okay, this is financial income by household. Asians here on the far left, just under 100,000. White Americans at age 76,000. Hispanics at 56. And black Americans at 45,000. Okay, and then typically what you see is only the blue bar. And they'll show, they guilt you. This is why we need to do this. Look how racist of a country we are. They never show you the gray bars, the corresponding number for unwed births by demographic. Now, I want to make sure it's clear. This is not, we're not talking divorces. Unwed births by demographic. This is a direct correlation. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. You know, the things the grandparents and your parents told you about, you know, how you should live. Well, sometimes it just takes us to get 50 years of data to prove them right. But they were right. And that's how, they, for a self-governing country, our founders have told us, in order to have a self-governing country, you need to have a literate population and a virtuous population, okay? If you don't want a self-governing country, if you want one where you're governed, you do the opposite. And this is, this is what's happening. So here's the reverse of this. If we want to reduce poverty, again, this looks at it in a different way. Reduce poverty, again, doesn't matter by race, Marriage reduces poverty by 80%, 90% in, in demographics, in every, each one. White families from 22% to 3.2, black families from 30, 35% to seven, significant drops. All of this data is published. This one's actually 10 years old. They know this, policymakers know this stuff. Here's another demo, uh, demographic data, U.S. Census. Me, uh, median income for black couples set just under $75,000 a year. Unwet moms, 31,000. This is data that will never show you. Okay? They always want to live. Look at the disparities and difference. Well, how, why not promote the things that work? I don't know. But if you have an agenda opposite, here's the reason why. There's an agenda, an anti-nuclear family agenda. Here's the next attack from proponents of critical race theory. This is hot off the presses. They're now equating the traditional two-parent nuclear family as an extension of white privilege. Okay, uh, and, and, and the, the, this is an organization, the Nas National Council on Family Relations. They've been around since 1938. They so happen to be based in St. Paul. And it's an organization focused on academics as well as those family counselors. And, it's, and, they, and these two uh, ladies, professors, we're actually giving a continuing education webinar. And this is a direct quote from them. I actually wrote an op-ed about this. It got published in the Federalist this morning. I'm gonna be on Fox and Friends tomorrow morning talking about this. Guys, if you ever thought, well maybe it's critical race theory, it's just, we're just dealing with family, you know, racial relations and stuff. It's a programmed agenda to undermine the very core of who we are as a country. And this is, this is what they're trying to accomplish right here. They, um, they want to make the, the, what they call it, um, these are their words, non-traditional non families, the normative. I'm going, hey look, in a black community, we tried that for 50 years. You can have it, we're, we're, we're going back, okay? Uh, we're not heading down this direction. Another, another piece of data I want to give you, Native, 
native born blacks versus black immigrants. So black immigrants that come from the Caribbean islands, countries like Nigeria, like Nigerians earn 17% more than the average American. Not the average black American, the average, Amer average American. They actually, black immigrants, come to, have, are, they earn $10,000 more than native born blacks. And the reason, one of the reasons is, one of the big reasons is they haven't been indoctrinated since five years old that uh, anti-white, anti-American, anti-capitalist indoctrination. It happens in the community. It happened to me, and it, it happens all the time. Okay, we, we've had critical race theory for a long time, even our own. So as I conclude, guys, I want to make this picture. This is our family, but this is, you know, give, you know give me the chance for same as self-promotion. But this used to be the norm of a, a, an intact family. Just the clothes are nicer. That's it. But we were together even in the worst of times. We want to make this the norm again, not, not the exception. And this is what they want Minneapolis to be remembered for. So they can always have this as they go back and, and, and just drive their agenda. We're going to make it this. We're going to make it this. And as I close, I, I want to leave you with this, ladies and gentlemen. We're going around the country, we're going around the state, waking up Americans and reminding them of the last line of our national anthem. Land of the free, home of the brave, and it's high time we start acting like it. Thank you.